Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Acts chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 10. This is what it says. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had the, James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and when he had seized him, he Put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and roused him, saying, Get up, quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Pray with me. Lord, it's not just a long time ago. It's today. It's today that you, you break chains. Today you open doors. Today you set prisoners free. Give us ears that hear the power, the power that you have in our lives and in this world today. And Lord, give us grace and strength, strength enough that we might take part in what you're doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. One of the associate pastors on staff here is Jeff Ross. Jeff and I have been friends for a long time. We were in seminary together. Both of us served churches in LaGrange, Georgia, and we commuted up to Emory, 90 miles one way. We'd share the driving and sleeping responsibilities as well. It, we left so early that at least one of us could sleep, and hopefully it wouldn't be the driver. Well, we stayed in touch and, and uh, connected together quite a bit throughout the years. And we, then we started playing golf together. Now, Jeff is a very good golfer. He started playing golf when he was a boy. And so he can do what not a lot of golfers can do. He can rear back and just let it rip. He can hit the golf ball hard, very hard, and the ball goes long and goes straight. I, on the other hand, I didn't start playing golf when I was a boy. I started when I was an adult. So if I hit the ball hard, bad things happen. Ugly things happen. Very ugly things happen. But I'd been playing with golf with Jeff for a while, and, 
it was one of those days, we were playing, it was several years back, we were playing golf and he reared back and he hit the ball and he hit it hard. And the ball, well, it's still going. On the other hand, I stood up and I thought, well, I, maybe I've been playing long enough. Maybe today's the day. Maybe if I, I just swing a little harder, it'll go a little farther. Well, I think if you're a golfer, you know how this story is going, that I hit the ball and I hit it hard and it, it, it left the earth and then it took that little second, that second tier leap and then it took a hard right turn and went and started finding trees and water and things like that. Well, I, I grabbed my club and, and then under my breath, I said what golfers often say. Not that, I said something different. I said, oh, I need a new club. And that's when Jeff, Jeff said, I think it's the Indian and not the arrow. You know, you get to be friends with somebody and they think they can tell you the truth when they want to. <laughs> I can't, I can't. He came right out there and he said, I, I think it's the Indian and not the arrow. But the fact is, it's true. The club, well, the club's important. But it's the golfer is what's essential. For a musician, musicians love beautiful instruments, but every musician knows that the instrument is important, but the musician, that's what's essential. Artists, they spend huge sums of money for brushes, and the minute that they get those brushes, they pull out scissors and begin to cut them and clip them the way that, to paint certain things. But every artist knows the brushes are only important. It's the artist that's essential. This morning we read a story, a story about Peter who was imprisoned and, and the angel came to him in prison, woke him up there in prison and, and he broke his chains. He opened the doors and he set Peter free. Well, the Bible doesn't have a lot of stories about angels and I think the reason is because angels are only important. What's essential, what's essential is, is the power of God. And the book of Acts is a book about the power of God, the power of the risen Christ in the early church. And the power of the risen Christ isn't something that just took place 2,000 years ago. The power of the risen Christ is for today. And if ever there's a word that we need to hear is the power of the risen Christ to break chains, the power of the risen Christ to open doors and to set the prisoner free. And that power is accessed. It says in verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. That prayer, prayer is one of those ways that we access power of the risen Christ today. Prayer is one of the ways that, that God's power is accessed to break the chains. He still breaks chains, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. He still breaks chains, that He breaks the chains of fear, and that's the first thing that I want to talk about. Back in the uh, 1930s, Fluoride, a mineral naturally found in water in, in some parts of the United States, began to be studied a little bit. Found out that, that fluoride, that mineral naturally occurring in water, it was first discovered in Colorado Springs in their water that it made the children's teeth where they, where they weren't prone to cavities so much. And as they grew up, their teeth were stronger and healthier. Well, by the 1940s, Dr. Trendley Dean began to study well, how much fluoride is healthy for teeth and how much is not healthy. Well, they didn't have measurements for uh, or ways to measure the amount of fluoride in water until the, the late 1940s or mid-1940s. And and he discovered that it was about one part per million that if that was put in, in drinking water, that it didn't adversely affect anyone, but it would help the teeth of children. 
They would keep them from getting cavities. And he was allowed through the National Institute of Health to, to start, to start putting small amounts of fluoride in municipal water to give strength to the children's teeth. Well, when people heard that they were having fluoride put in their water, hysteria developed. There was one small town that said that because of the fluoride, it was discoloring their saucepans. It was causing them digestive trouble. And one person even claimed that the fluoride had caused their dentures to crack. The only thing was that fluoride hadn't been introduced to their water. They had no fluoride in their water. But fear, that's what fear does. It it doesn't care anything about the truth. That fear makes prisoners of us all. And if ever we lived in a time where fear was rampant, I think this is it. I think this is it. Back in 1992... The news agency TASS came out with a story about a woman named Olga Frankovich. That Olga Frankovich emerged in a a western Ukrainian town. She had been hiding under her bed for 45 years. That in 1947, Soviet security police had questioned her and she became so afraid from their questioning that she hid for 45 years under the bed. And that's what fear does. It makes prisoners of us. It makes makes us people in chains, behind doors. It makes us anything but free. It makes the young afraid to say no to the crowd. Fear is what makes married folks get caught up in fidelity for fear that they aren't attractive to their spouse. It's fear that too often older people give up because they fear that they have no confidence to cope with whatever is coming up. It's fear that makes prisoners of us. And that's the bad news. And I came not to talk about bad news this morning. I came to talk about the best news that you've ever heard. Jesus Christ broke chains long ago and he still has power to break chains today. And he breaks the chains of fear in your life and in mine. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and discipline. That power... It's the risen Christ, and is available to, to you and me today. He breaks the power of fear, but it's not only the power of fear. He breaks the power of resentment. I read a story about a fellow who bought a brand new Cadillac. He loved his Cadillac. There was only one problem with it. There was an intermittent noise, and He never knew when it was going to happen. Sometimes it happened when he was on the highway. Sometimes it happened when he was going slowly in town. Well, he took it back to the dealership three different times. And the third time, the dealer said, I'm going to put my two best technicians on it. And they won't stop until they figure out what it is. Well, they went over railroad tracks. They went high speed on the the highway. And they discovered that the, the rattle was coming from a door. Well, they took the door apart. And inside the door, they found a Coke bottle. And inside the Coke bottle, they found a note. And the note said, so you finally found me, you rich blankety-blank. But it didn't say blankety-blank. It didn't call him a child of God either. That the person who was building that car there on the assembly line was so resentful of anyone who might have enough money to buy one of the cars that he wanted to, to try and rob them of their joy. But resentment, trying to rob someone else of joy, is like drinking poison, that, hoping that it affects the other person. It's the resentment. It's the resentment that holds us prisoners, keeps us in chains. It's the resentment that closes doors. It's the resentment 
that makes us imprisoned where we never go free. In the book of Job, it's 42 chapters long. And it's not a big book, but 39 of those 42 chapters are about the trials and tribulations of Job. He lost his 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 children. He lost his 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 farm. He lost his family. He lost his health. He had boils all over. And 39 of the the, the 40 chapters, he had three friends: Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Not too many folks use those as biblical names for their children. And It's probably a good thing. These three friends, or so-called friends, that they they went to Job and again and again and again. They said, Job, it's your fault. Just repent and and things will get better. Job, it's your fault. Just curse God and go ahead and die. You have to get better to die anyway. Just, Just go ahead, curse God and die. And for 39 chapters, his friends just kept pointing to him, adding insult to his injury adding heartache to his tribulation. If anyone in the world had reason to have resentment, it was Job. And in chapter 42, that's where God comes in. And he turns to Job's friends and says, Job is righteous. You're the ones that were wrong. And and God says that that his wrath was kindled against these friends. But it's in chapter 42, verse 10. This is what it says. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. That Job was restored when he prayed for those that were in the wrong. Not when he he practiced resentment, even though if anyone had the right to, it was him. It was when he prayed for those that were in the wrong. This morning it may be that someone's hurt you and hurt you deeply. And it may be that they're absolutely in the wrong. Resentment will keep you imprisoned until you begin to to pray for that person. Pray for their success. Not that they they come to you to, to tell you how sorry they are. That might not ever happen. But Christ has the power to break the chains of resentment. Allow Him to do it. Allow Him to do it. He still breaks chains. He breaks the chains of fear. He breaks the the chains of resentment. And the third thing that I want to talk about this morning is He breaks the chains of isolation. James Stockdale was a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. For over seven years, he was held as a prisoner. And during those seven years, during one, one particular time, they, the North Vietnamese, they handcuffed James Stockdale with his hands behind his back, his feet in heavy stocks. They drug him out of his cell and into a, a sunlit courtyard where all the other prisoners could see him. And there in the harsh sun, they began to beat him for three days. And during those three days, there was a guard standing over him 24 hours a day. And if he began to fall asleep, the guard would beat him more. And he was there to be shown as an example of of what happened when you didn't cooperate. But in the middle of that ordeal, James Stockdale heard a snapping sound. And it was the snapping of towels And it wasn't a random snapping of towels. They were short and long snapping sounds of towels that his fellow prisoners, that they had developed a, a code of short and long snapping sounds that would mark out letters. And the letters that that the code were sounding out were G B U J S. Again and again and again, G-B-U-J-S. God bless you, James Stockdale. And from that point, to the time of his release, to the time of his death in 2005, James Stockdale would tell you that that simple act of communicating is what kept him going. It was 
that simple act of communicating that broke his isolation. We're in a time of isolation. That this pandemic, yes, the virus is horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But the isolation that comes from it, it's, it's wreaking its, its toil on lots of folks around us. And this is, this is something that you and, and I, with the power of Christ, we have the, the power to break the chains of that isolation, to reach out, to let folks know that they matter to God and that they matter to us as well. This past week, one of the much-loved members of this church, Doris Westbrook, celebrated her 100th birthday. And members of the church and, and some of her friends we gathered in a long line all the way out her neighborhood, through another neighborhood, and, and into another neighborhood. A parade with, with balloons connected to, to the cars. And, and nobody could get, get real close to her but wanted to let her know how much she meant to us. And that, that parade of cars went through the, the covered portico and, and I brought her a basket full of cards for members of this church and the staff. And when I presented it to her, she said, Tom, please let them people know, how do I thank them? And I said, Doris, you just did it. You just did it. And the gratitude, the gratitude on in her face and in her voice, I can't tell you, can't tell you how much it meant. And it's the simple act of communicating to people when they're isolated. Don't wait till their 100th birthday. You can do it today. And I know that in prayer, God will give you a nudge. He might give you a, a shove or He might give you a thump on the head to let you know who it is communicate with maybe to send a text maybe to write a letter maybe to pick up the phone and give them a call to let them know that they matter to God and that they matter to you as well let God use you because he breaks the chains of isolation the risen Christ breaks the chains of resentment, and he breaks the chains of fear. I want to invite you into a time of the power of prayer right now. Pray with me. Jesus, here in this time, give us that nudge. Give us a shake. Give us a thump on the head. That in prayer, we might turn to you. We might know your power, and with that power, you might break the chains of fear. Lord, I know that there are folks that, that have been imprisoned, especially in these days with, with a fear. Breathe the power of your Holy Spirit that we might know the, the freedom, the freedom that you bring, that we might know the freedom of broken chains. Lord, also know that they're folks that are battling with resentment, that somebody really has done them wrong, that has, has hurt them deeply. Lord, you have strength we don't have. And I ask that you, you breathe that strength this day. That folks have the power, the power to that you, the risen Christ gives to, to break the, the chains of resentment. Lord, I also know that this pandemic is, has called, caused isolation for a lot of folks. And closed doors are no trouble for you at all. Lord, use us. Use us to break the chains of isolation. Live your life through us that we might communicate. Sometimes you do it through angels. Sometimes you do it through snapping towels. And Lord, sometimes you communicate through us. And I ask that you do it one more time. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online, my hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>